name is David Schlesinger, and I'm a senior investigator in the Laboratory of Genetics and Genomics at the National Institute on Aging. I have an auxiliary title now of a distinguished, NIH Distinguished uh, uh, Investigator. I was born on September 20th, 1936 in Toronto, Canada. In Canada, okay. The, uh, my family had immigrated from a small town in eastern Poland in 1929 just after the crash. At that time, immigration to the States was already essentially closed, and so we went to Canada through Halifax. And uh, my, when my family became citizens there, we moved across to Chicago in uh, 1939, uh, where we already had some family. It was a, a significant moment in October 42, when I was just becoming conscious uh, and the Second World War had reached its low point. The Germans were at Stalingrad. The uh, Fran Europe had fallen. The North, A North African uh, campaign hadn't begun. And my oldest brother, who was a model for me uh, and 12 years older, uh, had just entered uh, the University of Chicago. He spent a quarter there, intensely interested in science, and then resigned to enter the army, as many people did at the time. So both the social significance of that uh, and the intense interest that he had shown in, uh, in science were um, part of my model for my later career. My mother uh, came from a, um, a moderately bourgeois family in this small town in Poland, Czechanov, uh, and had been able to go to the gymnasium uh, she, uh, my father instead, was already encountering the racial laws uh, that limited the formal education of Jews in the schools to a few years. Uh, he had taught himself uh, uh, English, uh, reading, both reading and writing. Uh, he was a, a tailor in a women's coat and suit factory. My mother had had the model of Madame Curie and she believed uh, from the start that science was the route to uh, liberty and uh, liberty from ignorance and want. And she had wanted to be a scientist, but that was thwarted by circumstance. So uh, she was also an influence on the children. Uh, both my brothers and I and our sister as well uh, were started, started in chemistry and were interested from the start in science. Uh, both, that may be genetic, but it was certainly environmental. It was an interesting time for that. The, the, the Chicago school system that I was in uh, felt that the, the best thing they could do was to get people through uh, grade school as soon as possible if they were serious students. Uh, and as a result, people tended to skip grades. Uh, this was socially difficult. But of course, it made everything go much faster, uh, so that I ended up uh, with my own laboratory uh, at age 25. Uh, the high school was quite another matter. Uh, Chicago had a strange self-selective system, so students could go to any public high school. They would come from all over the city, and on the south side, they would go to South Shore near the University of Chicago. On the north side, they would go to Roosevelt High School, uh, which is where I attended. Uh, there were a lot of peers, a fair number of nerds, uh, and a, an extraordinary faculty because uh, the people who were teaching, and especially women, had been through the Depression when it was extremely difficult to go on uh, to advanced education or to education at all and very difficult for women to find jobs at universities. So uh, as examples, Ruth Bannister, our physics teacher, was the daughter of the chief associate of Rutherford in the neutron work, a brilliant woman teaching physics at our high school. Uh, Ellen Wheelock, who was the direct descendant of Ebenezer Wheelock, uh, founder of Dartmouth, uh, taught us economics as a science. We had remarkable teachers. Uh, and that was a great help uh, in trying. And so the result was that I had very good preparation when I later came to the University of Chicago.
uh, and that was notable for giving me many opportunities there. The only biology course I ever had was a, a traditional botany and zoology course. Uh, and in fact, that's the only formal biology course I have ever had. Um, I learned it as an adjunct to chemistry. Uh, chemistry was a, a great love at the time. When I was in high school, biology was sort of messy preparations and uh, observational work, natural history, which was interesting, but uh, certainly wouldn't be described as analytical science at the time. Of course, that changed sharply at the time I was entering uh, college. The, uh, I could go on for there. Sure. No, no, <laughs> the 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 uh, model, the DNA model, appeared June 6, 1953. The University of Chicago had a unique educational system at the time. Jim Watson went through there. So did Matt Messelson, my other mentor during my graduate career. Uh, there were among many scientists who were trained there. It was a kind of bridge system between the Oxbridge system of tutorials and the usual American system of teaching. Uh, there were no textbooks, only original uh, documents and papers. Uh, there were no lectures. Everything was done by discussions with uh, high-level uh, staff, professors, who would lead small round tables of students and get them to fight over all kinds of issues. So um, the system was also one in which you took uh, extensive exams when you arrived at the university. And if you uh, placed out, if you were good enough at these exams, you were freed from taking those courses. In fact, theoretically, if you placed out of all the 13 required courses, they simply handed you a degree. Right. So uh, because my preparation had been so good, I placed out of the large fraction of these courses. And so I could double major in chemistry and in uh, literature. I did my honors thesis on a comparison of Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra and Dryden's treatment of the same topic, all for love. Uh, but I could also finish really the advanced courses in thermodynamics and inorganic and organic chemistry. So I essentially had finished the curriculum in science and math by the time I entered graduate school. The inclination toward chemistry was in part because I had the examples uh, uh, of my oldest brother who ended up uh, going through medical school, which was the requirement of the army, and uh, um, did boards in uh, uh, neurology and psychiatry before becoming a psychoanalyst. And so he was a constant example where he tried continually to introduce analytical principles and was one of the founders of, uh, of uh, attempts to verify psychoanalysis by re-interviewing former patients. Um, my other brother got a PhD in physical chemistry, and I had, among other jobs that I had to work my way through school, uh, typed his theses <laughs> in, in uh, advanced physical chemistry. So I got a, a, a birth plan, a birthing there too in terms of information. Um, it's hard to know why you would like one thing rather than another. I mean, if a man likes a certain kind of dog, then that's the kind of dog he likes. And, I was drawn to chemistry for those reasons. Uh, I entered the University of Chicago at 16, and uh, again, socially rather unprepared, but uh, intellectually uh, interested in everything going on. I came in the fall of 1953, when the, uh, the, the Watson and Crick paper was already in the syllabus for the uh, uh, science courses. It didn't make an impact at first. Uh, I should point out that at the time, the first biochemistry textbooks were being written. And a typical statement in them about DNA would be a boring polymer of repeated units, four repeated units. Uh, so uh, it took some time for the model to have its uh, full impact. Um, the my introduction to science, uh, to, to uh, biochemistry, and uh, then later to molecular biology, uh, 
the term for which was only coined during my uh, graduate work, um, was that I had, it was possible at that time to work your way through college. I had a tuition scholarship and then uh, you were allowed to work 20 hours a week. I took two jobs, I simply didn't tell one about the other so I could work a full week. And that made it possible for me to live on campus and participate in all the activities. The, uh, among the jobs I had were mainly things like vacuuming all the books in the major library. But a friend of mine who was much more savvy than I told me that you could actually work in a laboratory. And so uh, this was the laboratory of uh, Eugene Goldwasser. Uh, and I entered that lab as a technician in my third year, that would be 1955, uh, toward the end of the school year. And uh, I did the first purification steps for erythropoietin. Um, and within days, I knew that this was it. I should point out that in chemistry, I had been drawn most to physical chemistry, and I continued to be interested in that uh, until now. Uh, but I didn't have enough capacity to use mathematics originally to tackle the projects I wanted to do. For example, there is in chemistry something called a triple point where a, a compound can exist in three different states. Uh, and I was interested in what happened if you had a two component system. Would that give you a, um, a line rather than a point? And how could you predict it? Uh, there wasn't even a theory of water at the time, so that wasn't going to happen uh, for me. And uh, instead, the alternative was organic chemistry, which at that time predates physical organic chemistry considering molecular orbitals and things like that. It was simply memorization. There was a book with 560 name reactions, uh, a mercury catalyst at 300 degrees for two and a half hours. It was uh, agony. And instead, suddenly, I was doing some of the first column chromatography. The DEA cellulose had just been published. And we were getting purified, purified fractions of erythropoietin. Of course, the purification factor was perhaps 10 to the fourth with the steps I used. No one knew you had to go to 10 to the seventh, uh, which Eugene Golosser finally achieved and later cloned the gene for it. Uh, but at any rate, uh, that was a revelation that you could actually do uh, work in what was a new field still, uh, analytical biochemistry, uh, and do something that might be of interest and useful for humanity. The, uh, and so that started me on my way. Um, I was still a chemistry major. Uh, and so when I finished and I was going to graduate school, I looked around and uh, applied to a few places, one of which was at Harvard. Uh, Jim Watson had just gotten there uh, in the fall of 56 after several years in the wilderness, the, the, actually the desert, literally in Pasadena at Caltech, uh, and was starting his laboratory. He had a couple of fine uh, uh, research associates, uh, Alfred Tessier, whom I worked with, uh, and Ernst Fries and his wife Elizabeth, who were doing some of the first uh, mutagenesis studies to analyze parts of the code by looking at phage mutations. Um, and there were a couple of other graduate students and me. Uh, Jim had the most interesting ideas of the people I talked to. And so uh, I entered his lab in the fall of 1957 when I got to Harvard. Well, you've encapsulated some of it. Uh, Jim was not an experimentalist. Uh, his final experiments, uh, I still remember he was doing an experiment labeling the ends of transfer RNA to see if they uh, turn, over, turn over in relation to protein synthesis. And uh, he came to the point where he had to run samples in the ultracentrifuge. This was late at night, and he came to me to have me show him how to put the tops on the tubes ac accurately so that he could do a run. Um, he was not adept, but he had enormous intuition. He's always seemed to know 
what would be the most important questions coming up and which of those were mature. So uh, when I ran around looking, at the time very few schools incidentally had departments of biochemistry. Harvard had just organized a committee in biochemistry which had a number of luminaries uh, as the uh, faculty and Jim was one of those. Um, he suggested an experiment which followed up a famous experiment at the time of Messelson and Stahl, the experiment that showed that DNA replicates uh, semi-conservatively. And it was possible to imagine a comparable experiment for RNA to ask whether um, RNA and ribosomes, which were just being discovered, would show comparable conservation. Uh, that was the origin of a good deal of my later work. And I really took on that experiment and uh, as part of my thesis work. But uh, Jim was always there. Uh, the setup at Harvard was quite, a, quite amusing, thinking back to it. Uh, the biology labs, biological laboratories on the main campus at Harvard, uh, not far from the yard, um, are fronted by two uh, large statues of rhinoceri, which I thought were symbolic of the university to a considerable extent, uh, including the stuck-up noses. Uh, the environment was strange because uh, molecular biology was just beginning and was named during the time that I was a student. Uh, it was not popular. Most of the faculty were uh, traditional biologists, uh, whom Jim referred to as stamp collectors. And uh, the laboratories themselves were just over the rhinoceri, the floor above. Uh, and we had uh, a lar two large uh, experimental rooms with a very large office between them, which was Jim's office. And uh, the major goal was already stated. He had an old-fashioned uh, ultraviolet uh, desk lamp uh, with the large bulbs, uh, fluorescent for him, and uh, taped across it was a small piece of paper saying DNA, arrow, RNA, arrow, protein. And that set up the lab for quite a number of years. Um, but he's continued to, of course, to be uh, intuitive. Uh, in motivating Cold Spring Harbor to turn toward viral uh, genetics and then uh, to move into neurobiology and so on. My first work as an individual on my own was a paper that did the first attempt to see whether the structure of ribosomes was determined by the RNA or by some features of the proteins. And uh, it used what was available at the time, a physical chemical technique for looking at the degree of hydrogen bonding across the RNA. I showed that it was the same in isolated RNA and in the ribosomes. And that suggested that the ribosomal RNA might be the basis of the structure. Um, ribosomes had been seen, and uh, Alfred Tissier was beginning to work on them. It shown that the 70s large particle dissociated into two subunits of 30 and 50s. Uh, and I, coming from my physical chemistry background, wanted to apply some quantitation. So I did the first analysis using uh, classical techniques of diffusion and intrinsic viscosity and sedimentation to get several estimates of the molecular weights of ribosomes. I made the first large-scale uh, uh, preparations of uh, 30S and 50S subunits by differential centrifugation at that time and measured their molecular weights uh, and the percentage of RNA and protein. Those turn out, fortunately, to coincide with what's done now by adding up all of the molecular weights of the components. Um, and so that was w another one of the uh, projects. Um, I started the transfer experiment, this experiment to look at whether ribosomes were conserved by a cesium chloride method where you grew bacteria in a light medium and transferred them to a heavy medium. Uh, the same that had been done by Messelson and Stahl, except that you needed more of a difference in the uh, densities for RNA, which is uh, uh, smaller than, than DNA.
Part of that experiment had been done at Caltech by Rick Davern, a graduate student of uh, Matt Nesselson, part of the preparative controls. And I had done the other half. So we flipped a coin, and I went out to Caltech to uh, do the experiment. Uh, it took f another four years after I got my degree to finish that experiment. There were a lot of technical yeah. problems. So during my time at uh, Caltech, uh, the, the experiment failed, but it was a very interesting place led by Max Delbruck, a uh, uh, well-known physicist, Nobel Prize winner, and, uh, and uh, German Geheimrat and his attitude in the lab. And, uh, but I also met my wife. She was one of the few women at Caltech uh, working, in, uh, uh, working actually on a project on ribosomes in the plant, in the plant facility. She had her background in plant physiology at that time with a master's from Cornell. Uh, and uh, she was um, a, both lovely and attractive and uh, personable, and therefore very popular. Uh, I think she was intrigued by the fact that I thought I didn't have a chance. And so <laughs> I rather, was rather uh, uh, distant at, at first. But we did have a couple of dates. Uh, and when I went back to uh, uh, Boston, we continued to write, and I was much better in letters than I was in person, I think. And so uh, later she came and did some more graduate work at MIT, and uh, we were married and have been married since 1960 uh, with uh, two wonderful daughters and six terrific grandkids. Uh, the, uh, and Alice, my wife, uh, interrupted her scientific work until the, our daughters were both in school and has done everything, freeing me to uh, be the one who concentrated more on the lab. Probably the most in influential thing that I did as a graduate student was to develop the first uh, in vitro system that could actually make some little bits of protein. Uh, and the, that turned out to be the system that was later used by Nuremberg and others in the cracking of the code. Right. And uh, we just optimized lots of, again, physical chemistry. Uh, it turned out that things like optimization of the magnesium level was critical for, to get anything done outside of cells. Alfred was a uh, um, Swiss, and he had, had a double life at uh, Cambridge, England, working in the group of Kalin on uh, mitochondria uh, with the sour experience of trying to isolate subparticles that were uniform from mitochondria. This has been suggested by several people who can remain nameless at the time, but they didn't exist. They were just fragments of membrane-bound material. Um, and uh, he was also one of the top climbing groups, mountain climbing groups, in the Hillary group. He was on all of the expeditions up to the Everest one because there he was had come to Cambridge to work with Jim. Um, he was a terrific experimentalist and uh, uh, quite careful, very good teacher, and very good at uh, developing techniques. So he was uh, excellent for me. The, uh, and we worked very well together, worked closely together for years. Um, he then went back uh, to uh, Switzerland and ran the Molecular Biology Institute there for many years uh, with a long, uh, distinguished career. Uh, his mountain climbing essentially stopped uh, at the time he got married while, we were, uh, while I was a graduate student. He thought it was too dangerous. He went on a final expedition to uh, one of the big peaks in the Andes, and that was it. The, uh, so he was a remarkable character with a very dry sense of humor. Uh, he actually was in the labs in Paris when I was a postdoc there for a while before he actually went back finally to uh, Switzerland, and I saw him again there. There were different strands to molecular biology. Uh, during my graduate work, the Journal of Molecular Biology had started, and uh, it published sporadically. Uh, Jim would come through again late at night and see whether anybody had finished something so they could pull <laughs> together some articles for another issue. Hard to believe now. Um, the, but there were 
schools, um, a biochemical school based primarily on purification and enzymology, which had been partially German and transferred to the States with the uh, flight of uh, scientists at the beginning of the war, Second World War. And uh, then there was a, a British tradition of structure with X-ray crystallography and so on, uh, simplifying things a bit. Uh, and there was a French tradition, which was Claude Bernard and uh, Pasteur and physiology, uh, and also genetics. That was really the major source of genetics, I think, for the development of most molecular biology. And so I was involved more in the French school at that point uh, than in the biochemistry school. Well, the, the Pasteur was a, an extraordinary place. Uh, French science, like f everything in France, d operates by trying to develop a cadre of the highest quality uh, at the special schools, the Polytechnique and so on in Paris, and then not worrying about the rest of the country. But they draw on their very best for their and so it was not only Jacques Monod and François Jacob and André Leveuf and Pierre Schaeffer and Elie Volman. It was a lineup of uh, impressive people, uh, all very original, very interesting. Um, there would be a daily lunch that everybody would attend in a kind of greenhouse uh, as part of the Pasteur Institute with a long table with the luminaries, the important people at the center, and then drifting out to the postdocs and students off at the edge. Uh, and the conversations were fascinating. Um, the French are so highly intellectual in these circles. There could be long discussions of the use of the comma, as well as scientific uh, issues. Jacques was uh, a very impressive person. Um, he was, he had the fine Gallic features and the uh, personality and wit that you associate with uh, French stereotypically. Um, and uh, he led the way. He was often the major person. I could say that uh, you, there was a certain self-confidence which approached arrogance. He, uh, for example, typically there'd be visitors giving seminars. And Monod's uh, uh, would almost always say in the discussions after, after the visitor was gone, uh, il a fait tout le travail, mais il n'a rien compris. He did all the work, but he understood nothing. And then he would explain the significance of that person's right. work. Um, in my own case, um, being in Paris was terrific. Alice and I had our honeymoon on the ship going over. And uh, I still think that Paris is the best place in the world to be if you're young, and it's not so bad if you're old. Uh, but the laboratory experience was mixed um, because uh, essentially I accomplished almost nothing while I was there. I had been come there supposedly to work on the physical chemistry of beta-galactosidase, which was a large molecule about which nothing was known. Uh, it had been studied genetically, and so I was supposed to do that. Instead, Monod knew that I had done this in vitro system, and he wanted to use it to prove the messenger RNA hypothesis that was in the air at the time. Uh, he and Jacob had, were writing a review, uh, which I proofread uh, uh, at the time, and the uh, on messenger RNA and the idea that they would program the ribosomes. So the notion, the experiment that he wanted me to do was to take a population of messenger RNA extracted from cells making huge levels of the enzyme and supply it to a protein synthesis system from a cell that had deleted the gene and show that I could make beta-galactosidase. Um, I didn't think the system was up to it. Uh, and unfortunately, I was right. Um, it was very difficult to get messenger RNAs the size of beta-galactosidase intact, uh, and they have a lot of structure so that the ribosomes can't get past the beginning if you have a finished RNA. In vivo, of course, the ribosomes are adding as the 
message is being made, and so there's no problem. Uh, so uh, it took two years to show that the experiment had not worked. Uh, I told Mano that I'd prefer to work on what I'd come for, and he said, it's my laboratory, and you'll do what I say when you're here. The, uh, and the, it looked as if the experiment had worked, and, but I kept doing controls uh, because I was suspicious of the fact that the counts were relatively low for incorporated radioactive amino acids, and it turned out to be adventitious binding to uh, the enzyme. The enzyme was highly purified by a bunch of steps, including columns, and then immunoprecipitation and washing the immunoprecipitates. Adventitious binding still hung on. Uh, so uh, I did some other work on the side while I was there, but the actual work, I, I, my major work there, produced nothing uh, viable at the time. Still, we had a great time, and uh, I moved from there then to St. Louis uh, with great anticipation. I took it as it came. I had managed a few experiments on the side that gave me some publications during, during the period. And uh, I shouldn't underestimate the idealism and the, the impressive teachings of Monod. I think I've been too critical in describing him. Um, for example, shortly before I left, he uh, asked me to speak with him. And he asked me what I was thinking of doing. Um, and at the time, I decided uh, I've always been interested in starting something new. Uh, and uh, that will be evident from looking at the course of what I've done. It's always more interesting to start out something. And the uh, others are usually better at, uh, at uh, doing the continuations than I am anyway. Uh, and so I thought I would start out something that hadn't been done, and that would be the structure of membranes. Um, membranes had not been studied at all. It was considered that they were sort of framework into which other proteins would, would sit in these lipid, lipid, lipoprotein backbone on the membrane. But nothing was known, really. And so I thought I would attack that problem. And I told Mano that. And he said, well, he said, that sounds interesting. He said, I suggest that uh, it's wise to take a problem on for your lifetime that you think may exceed your capacity to complete it. And then if you finish it, you have tremendous satisfaction. But if you don't, you know that at least you've worked on what you wanted to, and you've probably made significant progress. The, uh, and I valued that enormously as an opinion. The, uh, so uh, when I came to St. Louis, to Washington University, the, uh, I set out to work on membranes. And uh, the, the, uh, the experiments were quite difficult. They involved running columns in which, uh, in soap, or detergents of different types, and with very few markers for what might be in the membrane. I had a little spectroscope for looking at cytochromes and uh, some other things that would be there. Uh, but I kept finding that my preparations were filled with RNA. And so, inevitably, I looked back at that, and it turned out that what, they were, what was bound to the membranes were polyribosomes. Uh, so that was the first observation of actual polyribosomes from the bacteria. Normally, the polyribosomes get cleaved and degraded to single ribosomes, which is all anyone had ever seen previously. So there was the notion of polyribosomes, but these were the actual things. So I thought, Fate has told me that I should be working on ribosomes. <laughs> and so I went back to that. Uh, fortunately, the membrane problem was not ready for solution at that point. The Department of Microbiology in St. Louis, Washington University had been a, a real center uh, for many reasons, including the fact that they had no nepotism rule so that Carl and Gertie Corey could both be on the faculty there and not at very many other places. So they had a strong biochemistry department, excellent chemistry department. Uh, Dave Lipkin, the, who was the chemical discoverer of cyclic AMP, uh, many other, Rita Levy-Montalcini and uh, Victor Hamburger in the biology department. Uh, 
And there was a network of colleagues, which was very nurturing and terrific. The microbiology department had been the star department run by Arthur Kornberg with all of his uh, remarkable associates. And they had just moved en masse to a new building that was constructed for them at Stanford. So the department was empty. And uh, Herman Eisen, an immunologist of note who later went to MIT, uh, took on the uh, department as department head. And he went around looking for young people. He actually came to Paris to interview Clyde Wilson, who was another postdoc there at the time uh, at the Pasteur. Uh, Clyde later went back to Berkeley and spent his career there. But we met, and uh, later um, I went to look at a job at Berkeley uh, to, as a possible possibility. I must say that going to Paris was quite naive uh, in those days. The idea of going to work in a foreign country and without any idea of how one might find work later in the States never occurred to us. Uh, we were simply interested in the science. And uh, as it turned out, uh, Berkeley had the virus laboratory run by uh, Wendell Stanley, a rather Eisenhower-like figure, uh, very vuncular. And it had some wonderful people, Gunther Stent, Arthur Pardee, uh, Howard Schachman. And so they were looking for a young faculty member, and they invited me to come to visit. I see this in retrospect as, as watching the history of molecular biology unfold uh, as a student uh, and looking at all these higher-ups and their achievements. So it was an impressive lineup of faculty, um, but it was a strange setup where I would have been the only young assistant professor, and I knew what that meant. Lots of committee work, and the telephone problem, and the parking problem, and lots of teaching, and so on. Uh, and it was also an odd circumstance. I had grown up and been interested in quite intellectual circles with a lot of discussion of science and art and so on. There was a big party there, and the topics of discussion were brands of scotch, um, football, and cars, about none of which I knew anything. So I was really sort of turned off by that. On the other hand, it was a wonderful setup. But on the way back, Herman Eisen had heard that I was going to Berkeley and invited me to stop. And this was now in April. And uh, what, what year? I guess it would have been um, 62. 62. And uh, the, the, uh, in contrast to the ideal climate flourishing with uh, flowers and beauty everywhere in Berkeley, it was a rainy, miserable, cold, early spring day in St. Louis. But St. Louis was quite different, especially with the departure of the Kornberg Group. They were interested in having someone young in molecular biology. It was a new department starting out again. And so uh, I took that job and arrived there in August of 1962 uh, with my wife and our little uh, first daughter, who was a little baby at the time, uh, and uh, spent 35 years there. Well, of course, I've continued to be interested in it. At the time, I was writing bad plays. And uh, the, the clincher for me was that uh, I was fluent and I could get people on and off the stage. Uh, but I wasn't good at character development. I just didn't feel I had anything really original to say. Furthermore, I thought, well, if I go on in science, anyone can contribute something in science. Whereas in literature, you have to be really quite special. And in any case, I can do it on the side. OK, of course, any real profession is consuming. Um, but we've con my wife and I have both had interests, uh, uh, especially in, in theater, uh, over the many years. Um, and my brothers and I, and my sister, all shared that, that we were all editors on the high school newspaper. And I was the e editor of the Chicago Maroon. Uh, so we had a journalistic aspect that was appealing. Um, my wife was in the first class at Performing Arts, the school in fame uh, in New York, and uh, was the only one in her class who 
turn to science as her preference. She didn't want to spend her life in casting offices and lines. Um, and so it's been an avocation rather than, a, rather than a serious interest. I can't say that I've done anything significant. I think in retrospect, uh, I was very dubious about my capacity to be an independent investigator. No one knows whether they can cut mustard. Uh, and I uh, thought that I tried this membrane stuff and then went back to ribosomes. And so my interest was in trying to figure out what, how ribosomes actually worked and how that fitted into the paradigm of the intervention of DNA into the uh, cytoplasm of cells. So I had a scientific goal that carried me through. Uh, and because I was in a medical school, uh, I also turned toward the relationship between that and infectious diseases. I had a lot of contact with the infectious disease group uh, led by Gerald Medoff, Jerry Medoff, an old friend. And uh, the, so my work on ribosomes turned first to the formulation of the ribosome cycle in protein synthesis. And the, that was based on the uh, hypothesis that once a 70S ribosome was formed, it was not permanently the same, but would periodically dissociate into the subunits, which would go into a pool and be re-recruited into various 70S ribosomes on messenger RNAs. That was the model. Um, we did a lot to establish that model. And at the same time, again, in part because of the environment at a medical school, uh, we worked a lot on uh, antibiotics many of which work, act, act at the level of ribosomes. Um, we defined stages in protein synthesis on the ribosome, initiation and so on, and uh, then we're able to classify antibiotics at the point at which they worked. For example, one of the most interesting was uh, streptomycin. That class of antibiotics blocks uh, at a step in initiation, which we specified exactly which point it would occur at with uh, one of my colleagues, my postdocs at the time, uh, and also a colleague, Lucio Luzzato. And uh, it freezes the ribosomes into a dead form, and they can't continue, and gradually the ribosomes are depleted, and that's why the cells die with that cytal antibiotic. So there's a lot of work on uh, why some antibiotics kill and others just block growth. Uh, we extended that to antifungal antibiotics, uh, which we did a great deal of work. So there was a good deal going on in, uh, uh, that continued the ribosome work in St. Louis. Later, we extended it to uh, mammalian ribosomes. On along the way, we defined the steps in the synthesis of ribosomes. Uh, we found the first of the RNA processing enzymes, uh, RNAs3 in bacteria and E. coli. Uh, that's an enzyme which had been known to uh, cut double-stranded RNAs. And we showed that it also cut double-stranded regions within otherwise single-stranded RNAs. And the, the base pairing principle has remained uh, involved in nearly all processing steps that are analyzed. But the, uh, that enabled it to start with a huge precursor of the ribosomal RNA bacteria and cut it up, and then there are further steps that are involved. Uh, we did the same thing in, in uh, mammalian ribosomes uh, and showed the large precursor and the steps in which uh, it's progressively cut to form the final product. We did a lot of work on turnover and what might be the mechanisms of breakdown of uh, message and of uh, ribosomes. So uh, it centered on that through a period of decades um, up until about 1985. And that was the time when there was a big transition in the work. At that time, and perhaps still, uh, there were two kinds of graduate departments. 
some, usually at state schools or larger schools, would have enormous numbers of students. And then there were schools like Columbia or Washington University, which had small graduate programs of highly talented students, but in small numbers. So over the years, I had relatively few graduate students, but they're all terrific. And so the lab ran mainly on uh, my own hands and postdocs. Uh, and science has always been international. There were people who were appealed to by the work and came from many places. And I benefited enormously, as any scientist does, from these colleagues. Uh, over the years, I've certainly had well over 300 uh, fellows. and. Uh, a very large fraction of them are, have had real careers of, and some of them have real notes. The, uh, and that's part of the satisfaction of the work, of course. The uh, science is always so international. Uh, actually, to step back uh, for the, exper the transfer experiment, where we needed heavy media for ribosomes, we needed to have pure C13. Uh, for the experiment at Caltech uh, in order to make C13CO2, which we fed to yeast. We broke open the yeast, and that gave us amino radioactive amino acids to feed bacteria and, and also to make them heavy. Um, Linus Pauling was a connection, went to uh, the uh, academy in Russia where they had a production of pure C13. And we got C13, which we could use for the experiment. This is in the depths of the Cold War. There were always the scientist uh, contacts. Well, the, my own work had continued. Uh, and one of the frustrating parts of it, as, which was a minor element overall in the, in the real world, but major for me, was that we wanted to look at the units of ribosomal DNA from mammalian cells, from human cells. It was too big to be cloned. And so we couldn't get the material we wanted to start from to look at how it would function and whether all of it was necessary to make a ribosome and so on. Um, at the time, um, one of my colleagues, the critical colleague in uh, genetics, was Maynard Olson. And, um, Maynard does not suffer, suffer fools gladly, but I had given a seminar that he liked on the N termini of proteins in the genetics department uh, and what was known about them and how difficult it was to study them because most of them were just imagined from sequence. So he didn't really know what there was there. So it was very difficult to s discriminate among theories about how degradation or synthesis would work. So Maynard called me one day in, in the hall and asked me whether I'd come to see him, and I did. And at the time, um, the yeast community had already established the rules for how to make an artificial chromosome in yeast. They had isolated telomeres and centromeres and had selectable markers so you could make an artificial chromosome. Uh, in Maynard's lab, um, his graduate student, David Burke, and another graduate student, uh, with another graduate student, Dan Garza, uh, David wanted to try to see if he could use artificial chromosomes as a cloning vector. Um, Maynard had been uncertain about that because David had, Burke had another project that he should finish for his uh, graduate work. But graduate students being what they are, they went ahead anyway. And they had made some clones. And Maynard called me and to his office and said, you know, we have this potential to make uh, clones with yeast artificial chromosomes. We were thinking of trying to apply it to the human case. But we don't know anything about human DNA or human genetics. Would you be interested in working with us? And uh, I can still remember the words because it was something like the road to Damascus. I had this instantaneous flash where there had been some initial discussions by Renato Del Becco and others of whether the human genome could be investigated and analyzed. And I realized at the moment that this could be it. Um, here I'd been struggling with clones just to get out a ribosomal DNA unit. 
if you could actually make large clones, it would make all the difference for trying to recreate human chromosomes outside of the cell. Um, the analogy that I used for church groups and, and uh, middle schools was that uh, the cloning that had been available was something like dealing with a, uh, an advanced uh, jigsaw puzzle with tens of thousands of pieces, all of which were about the same shape and had similar color and trying to fit it together. Whereas with big clones, it would be like a child's jigsaw puzzle. Sure. A small number would fit together to form a chromosome. So the technology and much of the ideas were really Maynard's. And uh, in a subsequent conversation, um, we came to the possibility that we could develop a center uh, because it would require very large-scale effort, much larger than an individual laboratory could not muster, uh, to try to see whether we could actually capitalize on yeast artificial chromosomes uh, to do maps, that is to recreate physically chromosomes in overlapping clones outside of the cell. Um, I should point out that uh, the initial ideas of the Human Genome Project were not popular. There was a very large fraction of scientists who uh, thought that this was a technical exercise and had no hypothesis to drive it, uh, and so peers were appropriately skeptical. Uh, I wrote an initial grant where we had already made some clones uh, in, with the groups jointly between Maynard's and mine, um, and we want, I said we wanted to try to capitalize on this. Uh, it would give the two requirements of mapping, which are continuity and uh, totality. Uh, you have to have all of it, and you don't want to have holes, gaps. Um, and I got the worst reviews of my career. One of them was essentially one line. This is only mapping. Uh, so when we started out, we planned a center, uh, and I can go into that. It had some unique features for things done in biology up to that time. Uh, but we had to do everything. We had to get resources. I told Maynard that if he would continue to do his wonderful uh, technological advances and contribute those, I would take on the implementation of a center. Um, this was quite a dare for me. I don't have never considered myself, and I just objectively think I am not charismatic. Uh, and it required things like getting funds, since the NIH was not interested yet. Uh, I called together at uh, the faculty club at Washington University a group of the major professors at the medical school, the chancellor, uh, William Danforth, uh, a few other people especially the professor of medicine was important at that time, Dave Kipnis. Different medical schools have different dominant programs, and that was medicine at Washington University at that time. The, and I explained what we were up to. I wanted their approval to go ahead uh, with this initiative, and they agreed. So I then went to the McDonald Foundation and to Monsanto, the head of Monsanto Research, um, and each of them gave me a million dollars to start with. The McDonald Foundation was headed by Old Mac, uh, Mr. McDonald, who had founded McDonald, brought in Douglas to try to direct it away from uh, uh, missile and uh, just jet production, an interesting character in himself. He was a kind of real-life Andrew Undershaft, who was the major force uh, supporting the UN uh, initiatives in the, in the St. Louis area, and was very interested in science generally, had set up the foundation. His wife came from a family in which there were many Hopkins physicians, and that helped too. So he was behind it. Um, Howard Schneiderman at Monsanto uh, could see the potential and again contributed money. And so we had money to start. I then had to recruit staff. Uh, I was 
complete non-entity in human genetics or any of the relevant fields. And uh, yet I had to be able to mount this program. Uh, so the program had these uh, two major unique features, which are, again, are Maynard's thinking uh, largely. One was that uh, it was clear that we needed a substantial uh, group doing the mapping and that we would also need um, and bioinformatics, which a word that hadn't been coined, but we were going to have lots of data and would have to get together the appropriate people to analyze it and keep track of it. Um, so we also set up another unique feature at that time, a technical development lab. Um, Maynard and I both agreed on that one, that we came to the same idea that the technology wasn't ready. So you were setting out to do a human genome project when there was no way to do it. And so uh, that would certainly require either the adaptation of, new, of techniques that were developed by others or by us, um, and either we would stand in line trying to get help from experts who are already saturated, or we would have our own technical development core. And so we went that route. Of course, both Maynard and I knew that from chemistry and physics, where large programs and technical development groups are the rule. But it certainly was not the case in biology. Uh, and there were so many decisions that had to be made. Um, I managed to recruit appropriate people for the positions. I found uh, Ladina Hillier, who was working at a, uh, in a, uh, a lab studying the mechanics of the inner ear. Uh, and she was gifted for computer work and set up a lot of the mapping and uh, organization of maps, both for the nematode project for, uh, and for the human genome project. Uh, I recruited Rick Wilson later from uh, Caltech, where he was a graduate student with uh, Lee Hood, maybe a postdoc with Lee Hood at that time, um, and uh, gave him to Bob Waterston to begin the sequencing center. Uh, and I found a whole array of people. Uh, we had lots of experimentation on techniques, uh, many, many steps I could describe that had to be done. But in any case, we got it started. A lot of the scut work of the endless uh, reactions that were done uh, to find where uh, clones fitted in the map we did with a, a series of a uh, large number of uh, undergraduates. Uh, they would get a recommendation for a graduate school or medical school and uh, a temporary job, and we would have very active, lively uh, uh, people in the lab doing uh, the bulk of the work. So we had a, a core of technicians who were locally recruited. The, uh, and it was great fun. I had some uh, terrific postdocs who took on much of it. Um, the, the, uh, I could go on and on about the, the technical things that were required. The major technical ad achievements, uh, advances, were from Maynard's lab, Maynard and his associates. They developed a workable pulse field gel electrophoresis method that enabled us to size the clones accurately, which was critical. Um, they later developed, um, the PCR-based sequence tagged site formulation, which was the way we did the mapping. Uh, I recruited Phil Green from Boston, uh, who had been who had done the uh, genetic map that was available at the time, to have someone who could develop the theory for mapping for us, uh, STS content mapping, which is what we used and which worked. <laughs> fortunately, the uh, and so we had a, a, a core of people. I had two spectacular postdoctoral fellows, Yuha Kere, who is now uh, simultaneously a professor in Helsinki, a professor at the Karolinska, and now running the uh, human medical genetics at uh, King's College in London, and uh, Giuseppe Pelia, who uh, later started with me the Sardinia project as well and did a lot of the mapping work. Uh, unfortunately died young. Uh, 
and uh, uh, Ramaya Nagaraj, who's been my uh, closest associate now for almost 25 years, and who actually put together single-handed from huge varieties of data the map of the X chromosome. So there was a lot of talent uh, that we managed to recruit and that we put together. Um, when we started, we chose uh, the X chromosome was the logical choice because at uh, that point, 50% of the available uh, clinical pathology uh, was on, uh, genetic pathology was on the X because males have one X and it's exposed and it happens more easily. Uh, and there was a sizable community that were interested. The, most of them, of course, were interested in diseases. And so byproducts of the project were among the first genetic diseases to be cracked. Uh, first, Fragile X, uh, then uh, Simpson globi bamol, uh, ectodermal dysplasia, anhydrotic, uh, a number of these diseases were, were part of what my lab was doing and some of the people in the center were doing at the same time. So we had this thing which I named the Center for Genetics and Medicine. Uh, I sold it by telling people that um, the sequence of the human genome, once available, would be a, a parallel to the uh, periodic table in chemistry. Uh, it would be the starting point for biological research for the rest of time. And uh, that, of course, is true. I believed that if we could do it, um, uh, it was a matter of, uh, uh, in retrospect, uh, enormous naivety to start out, especially with the opposition of most of the community. Once we got started, um, there was a meeting called by Don Fredrickson at NIH at the time to discuss whether there could be a program and a, a leader of the Human Genome Project. I had jointly run with another of Jim's former students, Julian Fleischman, his retirement party at uh, Cold Spring Harbor at the time. So I knew he had open time and efforts available. And the discussions at the meeting obviously came to him as the logical choice if he would do it. Uh, the backup was Danny Nathans, who would have done a great job too. Uh, but uh, Jim accepted that. He came out to St. Louis. He liked what we were doing. And that was one of the reasons why the center notion was adopted as the basis for the project. It was a natural uh, development. The, uh, so uh, at the time, everything was always unsteady. Uh, an interesting sidelight, Jim told uh, our chancellor, Jim, Jim, uh, William Danforth, who told me this much later, that his one doubt was that I was being given a great deal of responsibility without authority. He was quite right. Uh, the medical school, doing anything at a university, made sense to me to have a Center for Genetics and Medicine at a medical school, because those would be the people who would be interested. Uh, but of course, it took a long time for genetics to penetrate into the curriculum. Curriculum is full and no one gives up contact hours uh, at a medical school. Uh, I had no space, no money, uh, no positions open. Everything had to be created on the basis of uh, funds that were raised. Uh, and that was a constant problem. Uh, you can contrast that, for example, in the history of the project with uh, the development after that of the um, center in Baylor, where Tom Kasky had clinical practice funds, jobs. He was the head of a department in a huge enterprise, money from the university, and so on. I had none of that. But he was a, a, a parallel career at that point, and, uh, and of course, very, very uh, impressive. He immediately uh, was interactive with people and uh, charismatic. And uh, uh, in fact, the agreement that we'd had at the, with the Genome Institute was that we would try to do chromosomes. We took on X and, and, uh, and uh, 
Eric Green with Eric with uh, Maynard took on chromosome seven, similar size, and having the cystic fibrosis gene that Eric had worked on with Maynard in in, the, in yeast artificial chromosomes. Um, and so we thought that was our assignment. When Baylor started, they also wanted to work on X. And so I was contacted by the Genome Institute to ask whether that was all right with me. And I said, of course it is. We'll get there faster. <laughs> the, uh, so the, uh, the division of the chromosomes made sense because these were the physical elements. And, and the initial uh, focus was on mapping. Well, it's a, it's a matter of asking Macy's about gimbals. The, the, uh, because of the medical relevance implicit in the project, it made sense for it to be done at the NIH. Uh, the, the Department of Energy was very good at some technology developments, mm. but they did not have the intrinsic biological thrust or background that you naturally had doing it at the universities. And so, uh, and that's the way it played out. Uh, I would say that the, the, uh, the tools they used and the uh, progress that they made, which were significant, were largely derivative of the ones that were developed in the, in, through the NIH funding mechanisms and uh, centers. Um, but they did have a, a role to play. They were definitely very important in convincing the public. I think they had a comparable impact. Uh, they were much earlier, as I remember it, on the ethics questions, for example, uh, which were then picked up by the, uh, more by the NIH as well. So uh, it's a matter of history how it went. And I only know the part of it I know in detail. I couldn't comment on that. We had good friends in the, uh, at Los Alamos, Bob Moises, who's one of their best uh, researchers and others who were involved. Uh, but Bob, for example, was interested more in certain features like telomeres than he was in a mapping project, per se. The, uh, uh, as it turned out, the, the technologies were strong enough to sustain the mapping until the sequencing developed uh, to the point where it could be handed over. Well, to be, to be honest, we were responsible for, the, <laughs> for much of the discussion, both technically and uh, in goals. And uh, I'm very proud of that. Uh, and I, I, I don't know how much it would be acknowledged by others. But uh, for example, in setting up the center, one of the things I did was in addition to working on the X chromosome, uh, doing the uh, targeted mapping projects for local individuals who could use them. We isolated the complement complex for a top rheumatologist, John Atkinson. Uh, we isolated the 18Q uh, cancer locus for Stan Korsmeyer and his postdoc, and so on. Uh, so we were not only aware of the, lo the likely uh, relevance, we were actually functioning to try to initiate it. The, and I think that caught the attention of everyone progressively. I, uh, uh, others may have had other sources of, uh, of uh, motivation, but that was ours. The irony was quite uh, uh, present to me all the time that 25 years later I was working for Jim again. <laughs> but uh, the critical thing was that there was no one with his name and reputation who could have the impact that he did on Congress. That was critical, and on the public. Uh, this was a notable occasion on which an obvious, in retrospect, and even then, an obvious extension of his original discovery was about to be able to lead, if done adequately, to the sequence of the human genome. So that was enough. He also realized that the center uh, setup would work, and that was quite critical. The, uh, and so he fostered that. He early on caught on about the importance of uh, ethical questions and having uh, LC and so on. And that was also important. 
So everything was in place by the time he left for the continuation of the project. Uh, it was uh, development, implementation, uh, expansion, and so on. And then the big turn to sequencing that were the critical events. Um, early on, I, sh I might point out that uh, when we had the only game in town, we were doing side projects and, and finding clones for everybody, uh, including uh, uh, people at the University of Michigan who uh, found Francis's center, uh, budding center, to be unable to service them. We were getting a lot of uh, work from other places, uh, the X chromosome community. Um, contention and envy and uh, people who are eager to be important are not rare in any field, including science. And that was certainly true for the X chromosome community. For example, one of the first targets that there was an X chromosome workshop every year and the community of people, many of whom were splendid and very interactive, some of whom were quite selfish and self-interested. Uh, uh, they were more interested in, in finding the important gene than in, in having the gene found. Uh, the, and so uh, one of the first targets was Fragile X. We were trying to find clones and distribute them to all the groups that were interested. When we got close enough, the consortium fell apart and everybody went their own way. And so you got uh, several independent publications from different groups, uh, all of whom uh, part participated in the first patent, the patent of the gene. The, uh, so in many ways, it was like usual competitive science. But there was an overarching feeling that there was something bigger that was being constructed. Well, it, of course, everything depended on reviews. Right. Um, usually, those were very good. Uh, in the last reviewing cycle for the center, so that would have been 1992, I made a significant part of our proposal based on uh, looking at the structure of linkage equilibrium and trying to get a handle on how recombination affected the, uh, was affected and worked with the structure of the genome. Um, and everything depended as usual, not on the extramural staff, but on the reviewers. Uh, an expert in linkage disequilibrium who can remain nameless was on the board and said this would never work. It was far too difficult to do. So that part of it never got off the ground. Uh, fortunately, Eric Lander, who had much more persuasive capacity than I, started the HapMap sometime later, and that went ahead anyway. But we were subject to the same constraints, the same problems of reviewing that every grant has. Uh, and we all know the problems of the peer review system, uh, and nothing better has been found. The, uh, so that was our major contact with the, uh, with the uh, extramural program was being reviewed. Was yeah. uh, to be honest, we knew what we were about and we knew what to do. Uh, we were usually uh, setting up things that would be adopted also by others. Of course, we were curious about who would lead it next. And the, the, uh, at by that time, the program had momentum. And it was clear it was going to go ahead how well or whether it could be stymied in some way wasn't clear. So yes, there was some uncertainty. Um, and Francis was a wonderful choice. He's such a brilliant uh, teacher and uh, persuasive speaker. And he had so many credentials that were excellent. So it was a natural choice. And of course, it's worked out very well. I think my feeling was that uh, everything remained at a pilot level and that uh, it was always important to be able to walk before you tried to run, so that we were early enough to continue the mapping. And again, the question was when the transition point would come. Uh, all of us in the field have been dominated by the development of technology. And everything runs by Sanger's rule at any time you get uh, technical development that's two to three fold or more 
efficient, accurate, cheaper, uh, a whole range of experiments opens up. So um, the question was, would these be incremental or uh, completely transformative? And it turns out that simple changes, like the development of automatic loaders for capillary electrophoresis, were enough to start bringing the cost down and make things feasible on a large scale. Again, uh, uh, it was Sanger and Washington University, rather than Sanger at that point, who were making decisions for bulk sequencing. The, the, uh, the real question was the point at which one decided that mapping could be dispensed with uh, and in the historical record, I think that's unclear. We did get to the answer, but it wasn't uh, an obvious uh, choice. The, the um, how can I put this? The one feature of the mapped clones that, has, that remains and has never been completely exploited is the fact that they reproduce large segments of the genome in a form that can be manipulated and studied. So for example, the ACT clones uh, that were made at the time remain the only source of a complete factor VIII gene, a complete factor IX gene. These have both commercial and medical uh, implications, uh, and they're only available by actually having the clones which are still achievable only through East artificial chromosomes at this point. Uh, there is the, the group led by uh, Vladimir Laryanov at NCI, which does recombination-based cloning that can help with that as well. So that remains something of great interest.